that we're looking at the story of an amazing woman. We don't know if she was a mother. We're not told very much about Dorcas, but uh, she's a, a great example, great tribute to uh, mothers everywhere. As God, as she had finished her work, and yet God amazingly restored her again so that she could continue a good work. And uh, so thankful this morning for our moms uh, whether they're with us or not, and uh, the example they've left for us. And we want to just use this story to kind of challenge us this morning. Along the road of discipleship, which is the road we've been traveling together, what it means to be a disciple, uh, what it means to disciple someone, to lead them further in their relationship with Christ. And if there's one thing that we've, we've learned um, and we're going to repeat it again. We're going to see it again in the life of Dorcas. And that is the discipleship. Being a disciple, uh, becoming a disciple, uh, is relationship-driven. It's not task-driven. It's not about what we do. It's about our relationship with Christ. And we learned this from Christ himself as he gathered his, his own disciples to him in John chapter 15 and said to them, If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, Jesus was telling them basically, uh, being a disciple is not task-driven. It's not what you do because you cannot do anything as a disciple except uh, you be filled with the strength that God supplies through Christ. So... As we go further down this road this morning, as you think about discipleship in your own life, you think of those who have had an impact on you as a believer. Uh, as I was preparing this, different pictures came up in my, in my mind. My mother was among them, and maybe your picture looks something like this, uh, because mothers um, have such a critical role and have been such an influence in shaping who we are. And uh, in some ways, mothers, and I'm sure there'd be no argument from moms this morning, mothers are, ta they are task driven. <laughs> there are tasks, there are jobs that they have to do as moms that are kind of fall into their lap and they're glad to do them. Um, but I think you would also agree that in all of those things that you do, what is important to you in the doing is your relationship with your children. You do everything for your children. It is all about not the jobs and the tasks, it's about the relationship. And so, so with moms as with, with disciples, it's not task driven, it is relationship driven. We're gonna see that in Dorcas as we look at this little story. And uh, I wanna begin with just a little bit of context. Don't always do this, but just there's a map of Israel and to the south you see the uh, Dead Sea to the north, you see the Sea of Galilee, where a lot of Jesus' teaching uh, took place in boats. We looked at that last week. Uh, if you go over to the western part of Israel, or, yeah, the western part, you'll see a little town. You can't make it out from here, but there it is. It's Joppa. That's where this story takes place. Now, in the New Testament, Joppa was not a particularly important city because one to the north called Caesarea had become the larger port city. But in the Old Testament, Joppa was the port of Israel. It was where all of the commerce took place. It was a very populated, very important part of Israel. It was the port from which Solomon, uh, Solomon went to receive the timbers that had been floated down to him to build the temple of God. Joppa was the port where uh, that wayward prophet Jonah took off. You remember God called and said, go to Nineveh. And so Jonah went in the opposite direction. He started at Joppa. And he, he went his own way. So Joppa has a lot of history in the Old Testament especially, but here it is again. And Dorcas, Dorcas uh, lived there, and we're going to learn a little bit about her 
on the road to discipleship. And this morning what I'd like to do as we look at this little story is just get you thinking about three things. Um, and some of the context will be the context of mothers. But broader than that, just as a disciple of Jesus, whether you are one or thinking about becoming one, I want you to think about three things in particular. Think about your role as a disciple, what it means. Think about your legacy, what you're going to leave behind. And think about the opportunities that you have right now through the power of the Holy Spirit to impact others, beginning with the impact that Christ has in your life, because it's all about that relationship, and then out from you impacting your family, your friends, those that you work with, and so on. So those, that's what we'll be thinking about this morning. Let's just uh, pause for a moment. Let's bow and pray. Father, we wouldn't pretend to open up your word and, and learn anything from it apart from your Holy Spirit, whom you've given us as a guide to lead us into all truth. And so, Father, we ask this morning as we open up your word, as we look at this story, that you would teach us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. All right, so let's, let's start with that first. Think about your role. Verse 36, if you're following along in your scripture, um, Acts chapter 9, verse 36, think about your role. What I'd like you to do is to step back from whatever ministry you have, whatever you do as a believer, whether it's on Sunday mornings or outside of Sunday morning, step back from those things and ask yourself, what has God called you to be? We do a lot of things, and they're probably good things and important things, but what has God called you to be? What is your role as a disciple of Jesus? What's the big picture? Now, as we follow through this story, we begin at verse 36 where we're introduced to Dorcas very simply, and we learn a couple of things about her role. First of all, her role was to be a follower. She was a follower of Jesus. In Joppa, there was a disciple, there's the word, named Tabitha. That was the Hebrew name. The Greek translation is Dorcas, the one we're using. And Luke chooses one identifying word to describe uh, Dorcas, a disciple, a follower. She had set the course of her life to follow Jesus, to learn about Jesus. That's what literally the word disciple means, is a learner. And so she had set her course. She had come to believe, according to that word that identifies her. She most likely was baptized. And she had set the course of her life to follow Jesus and to do the things that Jesus would do. She was a follower. And so when you strip away all of the other things that are a part of our lives on Sunday morning and at other times as believers, we are followers of Christ. And our course, the course of our life every single day ought to be set to follow him, to become like him, to do as he would do, and as the Holy Spirit leads us to. Dorcas was a follower, and then it's very clear, not only from verse 36, but beyond, that she was a good friend. She was a friend of many, many people. She was always doing good and helping the poor. And so she was modeling Christ, who is the perfect, the very best friend. No greater love can a friend show than that he laid down his life. And that's what Jesus did. And Dorcas, according to this brief testimony and introduction in verse 36, was doing what Christ wanted her to do, what, what she see, see, had seen in Christ, she was doing as well. As a follower and as a friend. And so just starting off, just verse 36, I'd like you to think about and maybe to rethink your role as a disciple. Because too many times 
pastors, shepherds, elders, deacons, musicians can become defined or define themselves by what they do rather than who they are. That's true for me. And so maybe, maybe it's time for you to rethink your role as a disciple. With Dorcas, it was simple. She was a follower and she was a friend. And if you just took what we know about Dorcas in verse 36, it would be consistent with what we read elsewhere in the New Testament. Look at what James says about religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Does that fairly describe what Dorcas apparently was doing and had done with her life? Yes. And then we have this description, Proverbs 31, very appropriate for today, that chapter in Proverbs that talks about the virtuous woman. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. And so Dorcas was right in the center of what God calls pure religion. Everything else strip away, and that's what you've got. Someone who is a follower of Jesus and who, like Jesus, reaches out to the needy and to the poor. And so mothers and others of us would do well to follow this example. If this is all we knew about her, we know enough. To, to strive to be a follower of Jesus and a doer. And that's an important order, too, because Dorcas was first a follower, and then she was a friend. There are a lot of people who do good things in this community and others. You know people who are just good people, and they do good things, and they're community-minded and so on, but they're not followers of Jesus. They just do good things. God has called us first to be followers of Christ so that drawing upon that relationship, it will overflow with the things that he wants us to do toward others. So think about your role this morning. And then second, think about your legacy. Now, some of you who are younger, <laughs> you haven't thought much about your legacy, what you're going to leave. But you know, everyone here, um, has a heritage that has been passed on to us by parents and maybe grandparents and others. I'm going to talk about the material stuff, but those things that you've received from others who have gone into shaping who you are. Every one of us has a heritage, and every one of us leaves a legacy, someone else's heritage to our children, to our friends. I want you to think about that this morning for a few moments. Dorcas had left an amazing legacy according to this story. And uh, apparently she had, she had two goals. She was able to serve in the shadow of death. Now she didn't probably know, I don't know if it was a long illness or a sudden death, we're not told by the story. But Dorcas had somehow learned that secret that we ought to learn, to live as though we were going to die. Now, what does that do to the way you live? Prioritize. Prioritize. Sure does. It gives you a new perspective on what you do because you have a, a new priorities in your life. Talk to Tom Booth and Margie about living in the shadow of death. Talk to someone, or maybe you've heard stories of those who were in the bombing Marathon bombing in Boston or Shady Hook or any other number of tragedies who have been faced themselves with death or the death of a loved one. And some of you here have been faced with that kind of situation. It changes the way you think. It changes your priorities. And it changes the way you live. Dorcas was living while she lived in the shadow of death. She knew what was important. She was practicing pure religion. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Now, what's interesting about that description there 
is that uh, the Jews had three days to bury a body. That was according to the law. There were three days that you had from the time a person died to the time they needed to be buried. And what do we read that they had done here? She became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. It hadn't been prepared for burial, for the anointing and so on. It had simply been washed and placed in an upstairs room. There's no doubt in my mind, and again we're not told, but that, 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 that those around Dorcas who had, uh, were disciples of Jesus, who had seen what Jesus had done, even raising people from the dead, and seeing the miracles of Peter and other apostles, it's clear to me that they were hoping for a miracle. They were so attached to this woman that they were not willing yet to bury her. And so they placed her body in an upstairs room. She who had lived in the shadow of death, they weren't willing yet to give her up to death. What a challenge it is for, for you and me to live in the shadow of death. As though death were coming tomorrow. How our lives would be reorganized and changed. Dorcas had learned that secret. And she had also, during her life, she strived for success. A word that uh, means a lot of different things to us. We hear the word success, and immediately you have probably the same pictures I have in my mind. Of achievement, maybe money and material things and wealth. Strive for success in life. That's what the person who lives in the shadow of death is doing in, in life. Striving for success as God defines it. When the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. And so they had already been thinking about the future and the hope of resurrection. And so they called for Peter. Now this, by the way, was way above Peter's pay grade. I mean, Peter was a remarkable apostle. And he had done some remarkable things, but he would never raised anybody from the dead. And yet they called him urgently. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. The grammar of this passage suggests that the widows standing around were actually wearing the clothes that Dorcas had made, had been the beneficiaries of that ministry. And so what you see described here is a kind of memorial service to this, this woman who had passed away. And they were wearing the wealth of her ministry. And they urgently call for Peter. And Peter goes into the upper room. Dorcas was not only, not only generous. She had given these things. But she was also industrious. That's what Proverbs 31 describes the, the virtuous woman. As being both generous. She gives to the needy and Dorcas did that. But she had made the items that she gave away, so she was also industrious. She was a virtuous woman who lived in the shadow of death and strove for real, true success in life. What is your legacy? Maybe you haven't thought of it, but maybe it's time. When you are gone, and you don't know when that will be, what will you leave behind to others? <clears throat> Tim Keller in his book, King's Cross, says something that I think is so simple and so true, and it fits with what we see in Dorcas. He says, if God already had perfect joy in himself, why did he create us? He must have created us not to get joy, but to give. God didn't need us to give him joy, 
but he wants us as disciples as we've received Christ and the joy that comes in Christ to, to give it to others by the way we live, the way we prioritize our lives. That's what real success is. And Dorcas had learned that secret in her life and it would be able to be continued amazingly as we'll see. But she had learned that the ladder of success which you know, we think about in our culture, the ladder of success really does not lead upward. It leads downward from God's perspective. Downward to the poor, to the needy, to those who cannot help themselves. True success is giving to others the joy that God has given to us. And especially those who are helpless and maybe hopeless. Think about your legacy this morning. And then finally, think about your opportunity or maybe your opportunities to do good, to emulate Dorcas as a disciple. Now here's the climax to this story. <laughs> there are two kind of um, opportunities that Peter sees this. And by the way, this story, even though in the book of Acts, uh, it's kind of about Peter, because first the focus in the book of Acts is the Apostle Paul, his conversion, chapter 8. Chapter 9, it, the focus kind of shifts to Peter. But as I read this story, it's, it's less about Peter and more about Dorcas. Peter's just a, someone they called, but it's all about Dorcas. But Peter does enter here. He goes to the upper room where the body has been washed and is waiting. And he overcomes death by prayer. We shouldn't miss this as a, as a teaching point here. Because Peter no doubt remembered a story, not that he heard, but he was a part of it. In the Gospels where Jesus uh, was called urgently because a leader in the synagogue had lost his daughter to death. And so they called Jesus and asked for him to come urgently. And Jesus went to the upstairs room where the body was. Well, let me show you what Peter does because it's going to sound a lot like that story. Peter sent them all out of the room just like Jesus did. And he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. Peter, the disciple, was doing exactly what he had seen his Lord Jesus do. Now, it's quite an amazing thing, but Peter was just imitating the Lord Jesus. Sent everybody out of the room, he prayed, he reached his hand out, and what do you know? Tabitha Dorcas rose from the dead. Now, we shouldn't take from this story that when we lose someone near to us that we should necessarily expect that God is going to raise them from the dead. I don't think any of us probably think that anyway. What we should take from this story is that there are some things in life that are fixed. Some things that you have no control over that are going to happen to you. They may be painful things or joyful things, but they're fixed and you're not going to change them. But some things, by prayer and by a dependence upon God, can be changed as God hears our prayers and answers them, as he did hear Peter's prayer. And then the goal, from God's point of view, should be our goal as well. In whatever opportunities God places before us, and that is to bring glory to him. That's what happened here. 
as far as I can read in the story, um, people didn't think any more highly of Peter. But Dorcas was alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And Peter would have said that is exactly why he responded to that urgent call. So that God might have the glory. And so God acted in an amazing way in answer to prayer, to bring glory to himself, to continue Dorcas' ministry. We actually don't know anything more about Dorcas from this point on, but she lived. And no doubt continued to live in the shadow of death, doing what she did. Being a servant, striving for success in life according to God's perfect plan. On a day when we honor mothers, it's a good challenge, uh, first to moms and then to the rest of us, that being a disciple is not about what we, what we do. We're here, we're worshiping, and we sing, and we read the Bible, and we do a lot of other things which help us to grow. But all of those things find their source in our relationship with Christ. And those relationships which you mothers have formed will form if God should bless you with a child. Those relationships are eternal. <laughs> They're the only, really the only thing in your life and in your work as a mother that is eternal. An eternal legacy that can be passed on. True not only for moms, but for those of us who are disciples of Jesus. Let's pray.